Okay, I'm going to continue with Immanuel Kant. Uh, last time I was talking about David Hume and Immanuel Kant's response to David Hume. Basically, if you remember, David Hume uh, applying his fork, Hume's fork, that says everything is a, uh, all uh, knowledge is either of relations of ideas, things that are true by definition, or matters of fact, things that we can only know through observation. Okay, that's Hume's fork. And Hume applied that fork to, to many of our beliefs, and a lot of those beliefs had to go. Not only belief in God, but also belief in causality, that things cause, one thing causes another. We all believe that. I mean, we believe that if you have a piece of paper and put some fire to it, the paper's going to burn. And if you said, why did the paper burn? We'd say, because the fire caused it to burn. If I hit my hand on this table loud and there's a loud noise. Why is there a loud noise? You'd say, well, my hand hit the table and it caused there to be a loud noise. I mean, so we use the idea of causality in every moment of our lives. We could not make sense of the world if we didn't believe in causality. We all believe in causality. We know everything happens for a cause. That's what Leibniz called the principle of sufficient reason. If you take your car to a mechanic and the mechanic looks at your car and says, well, I, there's nothing wrong with your car. I mean, you, you, your car won't start. And you say, well, what's the problem? And, you're, and the mechanic, mechanic says, well, I looked, at, I looked at the car, the engine, and I'll tell you what, <clears throat> there's, there's no cause to your problem. It's just, it just happened. You know that that's not true. Everything has a cause. So you go to another mechanic and a mechanic who will find the cause. Hume believed, like everyone else, that everything has a cause. I mean, he wasn't stupid. Now, Hume is not going to walk in front of, well, he didn't have cars in his day, but if he was living today, believe me, he would not walk in front of a car or a train because he knows that if he did, it would cause him to die. It would kill him. Um, Hume knows that he's not stupid. Hume, but his argument was that we, we have no reason to believe in causality. Um, we can't justify it. And the reason we can't justify it is because for Hume, all knowledge has to be either a matter of fact, and we never perceive causation. What we perceive is constant conjunction. <clears throat> and um, uh, the fact that A causes B is not a matter of, it's not true by definition, because there's nothing in the meaning of A that suggests that it caused B. Even Hume gives the example of you hit one uh, pool ball against another pool ball, and so one pool, the pool ball or the billiard ball that's moving will make the other one move. But there's these are two different, I totally separate ideas. There's nothing in in the motion of the first pool ball that suggests it's going to be communicated to the second pool ball. We only believe that. We only believe that that that's what happened because of experience. There's nothing in the idea though of one pool ball making the other one move. There's nothing the idea, for example, when I let go of this apple, the idea of letting go of the apple and the idea of falling are two distinct ideas. There's nothing the idea of letting go of an apple that suggests it's going to fall. The reason we believe that is through experience. <clears throat> That's Hume. So Hume got rid of causality. Kant ag agreed with Hume. Uh, as, uh, again, as I mentioned last time, Kant agreed, uh, said that reading Hume awoke him awakened him from his dogmatic slumber. Einstein, again, <clears throat> referring to Hume, Einstein said if it wasn't for Hume, he would never have had the courage to question Newton because Newton, Einstein, uh, Hume did not take anything for granted. And Einstein says, that's great. That's what you should do. That's how you're going to learn new things. Do not assume anything. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what Einstein, what, I, what, uh, uh, what, what, <clears throat> Excuse me. What what Kant did with Hume is that, as I mentioned this last time, Hume said we have no re we have we never observe causality, so we can't know it as a matter of fact. And there's nothing in the meaning of a causing b. That's not something. It's not a relation of ideas. There's nothing in the meaning of a that suggests b logically. Neither and and also we we never observe uh, we never observe cause and effect as a uh, as a, a matter of fact. So here's what Kant does. Kant says there are analytic, analytic truths. So analytic uh, statements. These are what Hume called relations of ideas. 
I'll, I'm going to explain what how, what Kant did in kind of in more technical terms. <clears throat> there are synthetic truths, synth synthetic truths statements. This is uh, Kant, Immanuel Kant, how he sees it. Analytic truths are relations of ideas. They can be known uh, a priori, a priori, known a priori. So, for example, you can know that a circle is round. If I say I drew a circle, you don't have to look at the circle I drew. You, you know what I drew was round because the, the idea of being round is contained in the meaning of circle. It's known a priori. If I say I drew a, a square, you know it has four sides. How do you know that without looking? You know it because, by definition, squares have four sides. These are known a priori, and they are necessary truths. Uh, if I draw a circle, it's necessarily round. It's not contingently round. That means it, it's contingent. If something is contingent, it means it could be one way or the other. Uh, analytic truths are necessarily true. Uh, circles are necessarily round. <clears throat> Synthetic statements, on the other hand, are, are Hume called matters of fact. And matters of fact... Uh, can only be known a posteriori, a pos, this is Kant's terminology, that means from after, a posteriori in Latin means from after, from after looking, from after experience, and they are contingent truths. So, for example, if I say it, the statement it's raining outside is a, is a matter, it's a matter of fact, I can't know it's raining outside by simply the words, like I can know a circle is round simply by understanding the words. But when I say it's raining outside, you can't know, oh, it's raining outside because I understood what you said. No, you have to you have to actually look. So it's a matter of fact. It's known a posteriori, meaning from after looking. And it's a contingent statement, meaning that it there's nothing necessary about it's raining outside. Maybe it's raining, maybe it's not raining. But you can't say maybe the circle is round, maybe it's not round. But you can't say that about rain. It's raining. It's a contingent statement. This is this is uh, Hume's uh, Hume's fork. Now Hume didn't use the term analytic statements. He didn't use the term a priori. He didn't use this terminology. But he he made the same distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact. This is Hume's fork. Kant, Immanuel Kant is going to say Hume's fork uh, is uh, in, 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 there's a fallacy called the false dilemma, meaning a or b. Uh, and while, when actually there's another possibility, C. And that's what Hume is going to, he doesn't actually say this. He doesn't say, Hume, you're guilty of the, the false dilemma fallacy. But essentially that's what he's saying. He's saying, Hume, uh, there's another, there's another alter or alternative. It, 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 there's another alternative. What is this other alternative? He says there can be synthetic statements, synthetic a posteriori statements. No, sorry. Synthetic. There are synthetic a priori statements. Hume said there can only be analytic a priori statements. He didn't actually use this terminology. This is Kant's terminology, but this is what basically he said. There can relations of ideas uh, can be known before experience because they are necessary. So that's a net for Hume. Relations of ideas are analytic, and they are, are necessary, and they can be known a priori. Uh, Kant said, and then Hume said there the other possibility is you have synthetic statements that can only be known a posteriori, and they are at best probably true. They're contingent. Kant said there's a third alternative. That means, and then what is the third alternative? Synthetic statements, which are necessary and known a priori. So Kant is saying there is another type of statement which is it can be known a priori and is necessarily true, even though they are not relations of ideas or analytic statements. They can be synthetic statements. Now for Hume, synthetic statements are all are refer to matters of fact that can only be known a posteriori. Kant is saying there are statements that deal with matters of fact, things in the world, like A causes B, 
Kant would say that any you take any event in the world, any any it, something that happens in the world, whatever it is, Kant would say, I can't tell you exactly what it's going to cause. I mean, that's a matter of empirical investigation, but I can tell you something that A will cause something. A will cause B, whatever B is. <clears throat> and B and anything that is any thing in the world has is the effect of something else. So Kant is saying these are matters of fact about the world. A causes B. <clears throat> <clears throat> when I hit my hand to the table, it will cause something. Now you know, may not know what it's going to cause. Uh, you, through experience, you'll, you you know it's going to cause a loud sound, but it will cause something. That is a matter of fact, and. Kant is saying that is not like something we have to look at the world to know that it's going to cause something. We know a priori with before looking that it will cause something and it's causing something is going to be necessary. It has to cause something. And this is something and what what and what you're what he's talking about is a synthetic statement. He's talking about facts in the world. He's not talking about relations of ideas. By definition, a circle is round. Yeah, that's true by definition. Bachelors are unmarried. That's true by definition. It has nothing to do with facts in the world, independently of our definitions. <clears throat> but when you're talking about A causes B, these are, you're talking about what's happening in the world. This is not true by definition. How can you know um, some matter of fact is necessarily the case and can be known before you look? How can that be? I cannot know that it's raining outside unless I look. How can I know that some that everything in the world is that any event in the world, anything I put my hand on, anything I look at is before I look, uh, whatever it is, is going to cause something else. How can I know that without looking? Don't I have to actually look at A and see if it causes B? See if it causes something? Kant would say no. You can know that everything in the world. Any, just randomly, you just focus, pick on anything randomly, just put your finger on anything, call it A. Here's the mind, and here's the world. Put your finger on any, any A, whatever it is, it will cause B. It will cause something. A will cause B. And you can know that a priori. It's necessarily the case. And... This, we're talking about matters of fact. We're talking about things in the world. We're not talking about circles around or bachelors or unmarried. We're talking about things, matters of fact. We're talking about A is a matter of fact, so matters of fact. And we're saying this matter of fact will cause some other matter of fact. And I can know that a priori, and it's necessarily true. How can that be? And, Hume, and Kant's answer is because cause and effect are in our mind. They're not here. So it's like we're wearing, as I mentioned in the last talk, little talk, we're wearing like purple glasses. If you wear purple glasses, before you look at the world and you put purple glasses on, you can know that what you're going to see is going to be purple. It's going to be filtered through purple glasses. So it will be purple. If you wear yellow glasses, everything will be yellow. And Kant is saying we are wearing space, we are wearing cause effect glasses. So everything, when anything A that we observe, that we appears to us, will cause B, because that's how our mind is structured. The, the Kant distinguishes between the world of phenomena, the world of appearance, and the world of the in itself, the noumenon. I'll talk about that next time. But for Kant, all of our knowledge is based upon appearances. And everything that appears to us will appear in terms of cause and effect. And that is a, so Hume, he says, Hume, you're wrong. Causality is not, is, causality is not, uh, it is not, Sure, he agreed. It's not a matter of fact. We impose it on the world so we know it's a necessary truth. So I'll develop this next time more.